Good afternoon, everybody. My pleasure to introduce you to today's um, afternoon lecture, which will be on retraining running in people with neurological conditions. Um, just some housekeeping before we get started. Um, everybody on Zoom, if you could make sure you've got yourselves on mute, that would be great. And we're taking questions today in the chat function. Likewise, if you're having any issues accessing um, anything through Zoom, please uh, leave us a message in the chat function, which will be monitored um, throughout the session. Uh, so it's my pleasure today to introduce you to Professor Gavin Williams. So Professor Gavin Williams is a clinician researcher who's worked in neurological rehabilitation for over 25 years, and he's the inaugural professor of physiotherapy rehabilitation. In his role, he works clinically in the neurological unit um, as a 0.5 full-time equivalent and in a research role um, for an extra 0.5 equivalent. Uh, Gavin, um, during his PhD, developed a program to teach advanced gait and running skills to people with neurological injuries and developed the high-level mobility assessment tool, IMAP, for people with traumatic brain injuries. Since then, he's become a world leader in the assessment, classification, and treatment of mobility limitations following traumatic brain injury. He's also been involved in the development of a new classification system for Paralympic um, athletes, which was implemented at the London, London Paralympics. Gavin is um, a fellowship to the Australian College of Physiotherapists, which was awarded back in 2011. So it's my absolute Pleasure to pass it over to um, Professor Gavin Williams. Thanks very much. So, uh, thanks for the introduction. So, yeah, I spend half my time working clinically and half my time doing uh, research, and I've had some involvement in uh, Paralympic athletics, uh, but my main role is really working in neurological rehab and retraining people how to run and to run well rather than actually coaching them to run. Um, so I am going to sort of give a quick overview of, um, you know, what we do and how we do it. I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about biomechanics because they're so important um, and inform or they should inform our treatment or our coaching. Uh, some of the important impairments that are associated with being able to move or run more effectively uh, and then talk about some treatment ideas before i get started just a quick plug for my colleague reese edwards who won the melbourne marathon yesterday uh these are my colleagues who were celebrating with him this morning and also my son who did the marathon yesterday okay so this is my scope of practice so i deal with people primarily with traumatic brain injury but also stroke and neuro oncology and you know ms anything neurological really so this is a young kid who got run over and uh uh you know it's taken him nine months before he takes his first few steps uh, on his own and you know his severe and complex movement problem and the challenging thing for us as clinicians is working out you know what's wrong and what we need to treat when there's so much wrong and it's easy to sort of get lost and then you know another nine months goes by and he's you know, improved quite a bit and uh you know it's sort of nice to think he's improved a lot but from his perspective he's still a long way from where he wants to be because you know unless he gets back to soccer he hasn't had a particularly good outcome uh this kid who was also in a car accident on the way home from footy training you know he had virtually no movement in his left side um and uh, you know this is uh, typical for us it would take two or three people to get him on his feet and uh and get our patients walking and then you know over time they make significant uh, improvements and some people get back to sport and uh, some people participate um, but people move differently they have lots of different problems and it's that's been the challenge and you know the focus of our research over the last 20 years is working out you know what do we need to treat and how we should treat it i want to get going mate <laughs> And so this is a guy who's knocked off his bike on a training ride. He was a sub elite triathlete. And so for him, obviously, you know, getting back to running and swimming and riding is very important. And it took us a few years, but he got back to doing short course tries. So rehab's a bit of a black box trying to work out exactly um, 
what we should do and how we should do it. Uh, and there's lots and lots of research in how you treat people, how to walk um, and how to go about that. But when it gets to a high level and, and running in high level stuff, there's really very little evidence uh, around. So I'll try and not put you to sleep with biomechanics, but they're pretty important. So at the most basic level, the two things that determine how fast you run are you know, how, many, how quickly you can take the steps and how long the steps are. Okay? Of course, it helps to be fit and strong of West African descent and pump the eyeballs with steroids. But these are the two things that directly determine how fast uh, we walk or run. And as we transition from uh, walking to running, jogging, running, sprinting, there's a greater proportion of time where nothing is in contact with the ground, which makes it very, very important for us uh, to make sure we make our patients stable before we get them into running uh, because obviously if they've got more time with their legs in the air, then that's, uh, they're at high risk of uh, falling over. Compared to walking, running is problematic when we want to talk about it um, you know, as a researcher, as a, a coach or as a physio because even though there's a lot known about walking, running is a bit of uh, uh, there's lots of blogs and it's a bit of a cult people have cult followings and the evidence about the biomechanics of running is not as good as what it is uh, with walking so i use a few old references because you know some of the knowledge has been known for years but this particular paper looking at the biomechanics of the hip and the knee and then the ankle is directly comparing what's happening at the hip in walking and then running and then sprinting um, and so it helps to know what the joint does and when it does it so we can then prescribe better exercises and, and training programs uh, for our patients. So we spend a fair bit of time having, trying to have a good understanding of you know, what does the joint actually do and what is driving that movement and how uh, quickly does the joint move through what range, what muscles are doing what. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about uh, that in relation to the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines, which uh, also guide a bit of our practice. We have this concept, uh, though, when we compare uh, walking to running, and walking's a big deal because most of our patients come to us and they can't walk, I'm going to teach them how to walk. When you walk, there's always something in contact with the ground, so walking is your base of support. But when you run and go from jogging to running to sprinting, a much greater proportion of the time, nothing's in contact with the ground. So it's inherently unstable. And so our concept is that your trunk is your base of support. So when I show some elite uh, running later on, uh, what we are after for um, our patients is a, a stable pelvis, a stable trunk, because that's the thing that needs to stay still so they can get very quick arm and leg movements from. So there are a few differences um, and the key difference really between walking and running is when you're walking your foot lands in front of you whereas when you're running despite all this additional movement um, in your leg your foot should land underneath you both from the perspective when you look from the side but also when you look from uh, in front or behind so this is a girl who uh, it's a fundamental problem when you're trying to work out what is going wrong there when she's you know wobbling around all over the place the vertical ground reaction force is is the force you know of which you're working against gravity okay and so we that means how strong do your extensor muscles have to be to hold you up against gravity but the ap ground reaction force which is the braking propulsion force is probably more important i think and so this reference here is uh, uh old and it's been replicated a few times and it's basically looking at the difference between elite runners and normal everyday you know um sunday warriors like us and there's a, there's a difference between elite runners and normal everyday runners in their AP ground reaction force. And that means how much, how far in front of their center of mass does their foot hit or how far in front of their body. Um, and so what they find is with elite runners, they're much better at their foot just landing underneath their body. And so they have these ongoing propulsive forces, whereas, you know, less skilled runners that just use running for fitness, for example, uh, they have their foot lands in front of their body, so there's braking propulsion, braking propulsion, which is obviously inefficient. And, and for our patients who are very inefficient, uh, you know, are quite jerky in their running. And so when you see a beautiful looking runner like some of the Kenyans or Kathy Freeman, part of the reason they look beautiful is they're just more skillful. And running's a skill, and very few people have been taught how to run properly. They, most people have done sport growing up. If you do swimming, you have swimming lessons, tennis, tennis lessons. Most sports, you get hammered 
So the cows come home with technique, but running is just, you just sort of do it. And even people who are coached in athletics, often it's just about reps and sets, and, you know, stuff like periodization maybe, but not necessarily about running technique. So it's important to know about running technique in, to, in terms of guiding your, your training and exercises and how, what happens to the center of mass um, uh, and how it progresses. Okay, so in terms of this uh, concept we have had for you know, a couple of decades, that your trunk is your base of support, we found when we looked at people with brain injuries when they walk, they have a really high prevalence of trunk and pelvic abnormalities. So then we looked at their running and thought, well, if it's bad in walking, it's going to be really bad in running. And then we found it was a very low prevalence of trunk and pelvic abnormalities, which is weird. And then we realized it's because they can't run. We're only researching those who can run and those that don't have good pelvic and trunk control, self-selectors, non-runners. And so it sort of just validated what we we're doing. But in cerebral palsy, there's a researcher in Germany, Germany uh, Harold Baum, who does a lot of great stuff in CP running. And uh, their work and IOS's work um, has, has looked at um, CP running and compared to walking, and they find that their trunks and pelvises are, are better in running than what they are in walking. And it's probably because for those that can run, they don't have to support a double support phase anymore. So when you have a double support phase in walking, your feet are further apart and your pelvis has to rotate to accommodate that. But as you get into a flight phase with running, you know, you've got the flight phase at the time that your legs can sort of swap in the air. And then, you know, if you have the capacity to stay still with your trunk and pelvis, um, you know, that is then allowed to happen. I'm just going to show this old video. And I'm sorry, I just, uh, I love it. Uh, it'll get, it'll zoom in and it'll look a bit better. But just to make the point, at the time that this video was taken, um, you know, it might have been me with a VHS tape back in the day. Uh, no one had run this fast in the history of the world before. Okay. But when you zoom in and have a look at these guys running, it's enormously impressive from the perspective that their pelvis, their trunk, and their heads are pretty still, despite the magnitude that their arms and legs are going through and how quickly they're going through that. Okay? And, you know, it's just something you train. And so when you see, you know, kids playing sport or adults out for a run and, you know, when, I, when we volunteer at the Melbourne Marathon, probably half the people running past, you could fix up their running technique. They just haven't been taught how to run. And what we need to be able to do is identify when something doesn't look quite right, what actually is it and what do we need to do about it? Okay. So this is at O'Bolton, so from the 90s, ran under 10 seconds a lot of times. You could have pl put a plate on his head once he gets out the blocks and you know, comfortably running uh, sub 10. Okay, so in terms of uh, like power generation for running, because this is what it's all about, power generation. So we talk about strength a bit, uh, but power is the relationship between strength and speed. Uh, so I'm just going to go through these graphs, that, which are from uh, Michael Orendorf's paper. Um, and so he does a bit of work in um, CP mobility, but this just happens to be uh, running. So the key things to think about, uh, because it can be overwhelming, just if you stick to the basics about what's most important. So uh, what the hip does, what the knee does, what the ankle does. So at the hip, when the foot hits the ground, there's power, absor uh, power generation so that the glutes or the hip extensors act very quickly at initial contact uh, to generate power to accelerate your body over your foot. The other big power event uh, that occurs at the hip is uh, hip flexor power generation. So that's you know, the groin or the, you know, the hip flexors lifting the knee as you go into swing phase and through mid-swing. But prior to that happening, um, we have this power absorption at the hip. So it's like um, people talk about the stretch shortening cycle. So um, uh, as the hip extends, um, then there's this uh, power absorption followed by this uh, quick power generation, which is uh, the stretch shortening cycle, so energy storage and release. And that's what's happening uh, at the hip. So that it just helps to know what, the, what muscles are doing the work and when they're doing it. At the knee, the most important take-home message for the knee is it basically absorbs power rather than generates power. It absorbs about twice as much power as what it generates. And one of the key problems um, 
in neurological rehab is there's a large um, a preoccupation with making the quads and hemi stronger and generating power when it's not really their role. Their main role is to uh, absorb power. So in early stance, they absorb power. Um, they definitely do generate power in, in mid to late stance, okay? Uh, but then again, in terminal swing, the hammies have to decelerate the leg. So, you know, in running, not sprinting, the knee is uh, moving at about 600 degrees a second, so that's quite quick. Uh, and so the hammies have to act very quickly, very powerfully in terminal swing to slow the leg uh, so it hits the ground properly and, you know, hopefully underneath you. Uh, okay, and then at the ankle, um, just have a look at the y-axis here and the magnitudes up the sides. So by far the most important muscle group of the, uh, is, is the calf, so ankle power generation. So it generates a massive amount of uh, power um, in terminal stance as we push off and push ourselves forward and propel our body forward. Um, just prior to that happening, though, um, as the power is absorbed in mid stance, and so again, that's that uh, stretch shortening cycle. And this is a really key thing in terms of um, how the ankle works and what the muscles are doing and how they're doing it. And I'll spend a little bit of time on that. Um, it's difficult when you read uh, some of the biomechanical literature on running because they use different terms like you know, jogging or running or sprinting. And depending on what you're reading, it's partly dependent on what speed were the people running at in that study. Um, and so it does change a little bit. Uh, so if you go back to those previous graphs on the hip, the knee, and the ankle, the graphs look different between uh, running and sprinting and because those changes are speed dependent. But in terms of being speed dependent, uh, and I said the two things that directly determine how fast you run is stride length and stride frequency. Um, it's similar to walking as what it is running and, and how do you accelerate to get faster. So this is from Anthony Shack's work. Uh, so when, so here on the x-axis, we've got running speed and up the side of the top, we've got stride length and down the bottom, we've got stride frequency. And so what we've got here are five different running speeds from just like a slow jog to elite sprinting, like nearly nine meters a second. And so the initial increases in running speed are related to increasing your stride length. Okay? So if you're jogging and you've got to go a bit faster and a bit faster, most of that occurs because you push off the ground harder okay, with your calf, which accelerates your set of mass further forward and you get a longer stride. Okay? And that's a really good strategy and it works pretty well. Um, but you get to a point where your calf becomes actively insufficient. And then what happens is uh, bigger increases in the proximal muscle group, so they, uh, particularly the hip flexors and hip extensors. And so the strategy for acceleration is stride length, stride length, stride length, and stride frequency. So with sprinting and elite sprinting, it's all about um, uh, frequency. And stride length is partly dependent on how tall you are. Okay, So taller people are going to have longer stride length. But the reason why Usain Bolt is the fastest person in the world is not because he's the tallest person in the world, but he just ticks his legs over faster than anyone else. Um, and so what we see is this shift as we go faster and faster um, uh, in the hip joint is a much greater proportional contribution of the hip muscles. Okay? And this is important to consider um, uh, because what we see with uh, people with neurological conditions is that they are more dependent on the proximal muscle groups at slower speeds. Okay? So it's just natural as you go faster and faster to become more dependent on those proximal muscle groups acting in the hip. But it just so happens that people with brain injury and stroke and cerebral palsy and stuff are using that normal strategy just at a lower threshold in order to, to get a bit faster, which makes us think, well, maybe we don't want to train uh, people like that the same. Maybe we need to really target the distal muscles. Um, and so we just raise that threshold where they actually you know, then progress into a proximal strategy. The other thing that's important to consider, uh, oh, sorry, the other thing is as the hips work faster and faster, unless we have got really good core stability in that person before we get them going faster, you know, that faster movement is going to throw their pelvis all, all over the place, particularly when you think about the iliopsoas acting, you know, across the pelvis on the lumbar spine. Uh, another important um, concept to get across is leg stiffness. So, you know, if you've grown up in neurological rehab like I have, 
you know, stiffness is a bad thing because say stiffness and you think spasticity. Um, but in elite sport, and particularly jumping sports and stuff like that, leg stiffness and higher leg stiffness is a good thing because uh, leg stiffness is when, when your body lands, and this is work done by Annie Chappell and Nola Gibson who are pediatric cerebral palsy researchers who have done work in running in Perth. When you land, your leg bends and then your body passes over your foot and then you push off. And how much your leg bends and straightens is called your leg stiffness. Okay? And people who are higher performing um, have higher leg stiffness. So they're better at getting on and off the ground. And you know, if you want to run fast, you want to get on and off the ground as quickly as possible. So in elite sport, oh, sorry, elite running, about 20% of the whole cycle, so only 20% is stance phase. So the person who can get on and off the ground the quickest can then recover in swing phase and get their foot on and off the ground again, you know, quickly. And the more quickly you can do that, the more, you know, the quicker you're going to run. So in terms of leg stiffness, one of the key uh, things is the Achilles tendon and, um, you know, the muscular uh, tenderness uh, unit. So the role of the Achilles tendon uh, in walking and running is to store and release energy. Okay. So there's an engineering paper by Sawicki that talks about you know, Achilles tendon. It's called putting a spring back in your step, uh, and which is about, it's not really the calf. The Achilles tendon does about 80% of all the work. Okay, So uh, the role of the Achilles tendon is to act like a spring. So what we want is a calf that lives on top of the Achilles tendon just to be strong enough so it doesn't deform. It's almost isometric uh, in nature, and if it doesn't um, deform so the uh, muscle fascicles don't lengthen, then energy can get stored and released in the Achilles tendon. And our orthotic and prosthetic colleagues know this well because you know these new age carbon fiber AFOs or the cheetah running blades, they, they're all about energy storage and release. That's why you know they're made out of carbon fiber, not polypropylene like you know they've had for you know, 30, 40, 50 years, because they have these energy storage and release principles like a pole vault has. And so, you know, the processes know it, the orthotists know it. What we need to do is come up with exercises that actually help restore the normal um, muscle tendon function acting at the ankle joint. And, you know, I bang on about the ankle joint because it's so, so important. And then hopefully if we can make the ankle function better, we can just put a lid on the compensation strategies that are going approximately um, so people are more efficient in the way they move. Um, this is from some of uh, uh, Sue Morris's work. She's also in Perth and was one of uh, Annie and Nola's supervisors. So um, this is in developmental coordination disorder. And what they're looking at here is from walking to fast walking, um, running and sprinting, and A2 and H3. So that's uh, push off compared to lift off. So you probably know with people who are having trouble walking, they don't push off the ground effectively. So you know, to get their leg forward, they lift their leg off rather than they push off. And so what this is just showing is what I was saying before is that as you go faster, you are more dependent on your proximal muscle groups. But what happens to these um, people with DCD here compared to the healthy controls is that they're more dependent on those proximal muscle groups at, um, at lower speeds. We looked at uh, recovery of running in uh, a group of our patients with traumatic brain injury. And so we just followed them up over six months and we were doing all this ballistic training with them. So this is an uncontrolled study, just observation, just seeing what actually changed uh, over a period of six months. And so we've got here, you know, traces for the TBI cohort um, before and after. And then I don't know why that's red and that's not, but that gray line up there is the healthy controls. Um, and so basically what happened over time was Nothing changed at the hip and nothing really changed at the knee. But we saw this big improvement from the solid line to the dash line at the ankle, which was pretty good because that's what we were trying to do. And so the, you know, this is, uh, sorry, I can't remember how many, 40-odd, I think, uh, people with traumatic brain injury. Uh, okay. And so we got that improvement, which is nice, but we still got to work out well, what actually changed. So we got what we wanted, but we haven't yet determined how we got it. So we got that improvement in ankle power generation, um, and that was uh, great to find. But you can get more power 
uh, because it's supposed to act like a spring, like if you want a ball to bounce higher, you just throw it into the ground harder, okay? We don't, do, we don't want that. We don't want someone to slam their foot in the ground harder because you know, you're going to probably get a stress-related injury. So what we found was they weren't throwing their foot onto the ground harder in order to generate uh, more power. Uh, so that absorption phase didn't really change. But what did change was the power generation phase that happened after it. So we've got to work out where did, the, where did that power come from. But, so power is the relationship between the joint angular velocity, or how quickly is the ankle plantar flexing, uh, and the joint moment. Okay? And so what we found is that improvement is partly related to the uh, joints moving more quickly, and we were definitely training them to move faster. Um, that was the whole point of it. And the joint moment increased too, but you know, it was only a small increase, but it did increase. It wasn't yet back to um, close to normal like this was. Um, the vertical ground reaction force, what we were looking at here is, you know, again, did they throw their foot onto the ground? Did they load harder? And that's what, how they got more uh, energy return. So no, they didn't. So that's nice to know. Um, uh, but we did get an improvement in their AP ground reaction force. So um, the, they got a bit more pro propulsion. And so we've got to work out where do they got, get that um, propulsion from um, and where they get the speed from. So the, the speed in terms of moving their joint more quickly, you know, so was it more you know, better neural drive, greater muscle volume? So we didn't measure their muscle volume. Um, or the, you know coordination of the muscle firing that's just an avenue for um, further research uh, but then there's also uh, oh, so sorry I was going to also say like we, we know that weakness is the main problem for most adults and kids with neurological conditions um, you know this is Simone Dorsch's work and you know just looking at all the different leg muscles there um, you know on average, are about fifty percent affected compared to the, um, the unaffected side. So you know, all the more reason why we um, need to focus on weakness. Whereas you know, twenty years ago, the focus tended to be on spasticity. So I'll talk about that um, in a sec. But then going back to this, you know, trying to work out the um, AP gram reaction force that that may have improved because um, the people were a little bit more effective at leaning forward. So we changed their postural alignment a bit. Hopefully, that's what we're trying to do, but we don't know if it was that. Or was it because um, their foot was underneath them or they were a little bit more plantar flex? So all those things would change the joint moment a bit and hopefully make them more efficient. And so we need to work out you know, which one of those factors was it or was it a combination of those factors? Okay. Um, this is another one of Harold Baum's studies from Germany, and he was looking at predicting running in um, kids with... Uh, cerebral palsy, GMS level, GMFCS level two. And so in GMFCS level two, if they're uni, uh, unilaterally affected, about two thirds can run. And if they're bilaterally affected, about just over 50% can run. Um, but he was looking at what predicts whether they can run or not. And so he's looking at strength and balance and spasticity and stuff like that. And so what was interesting because spasticity tends to just be lumped together and thought of as a bad thing, when he looked at spasticity and the muscle groups affected, if, if you had spasticity in your rec fem, so in your knee extensors, you were much less likely to be able to run, okay? And that makes sense because if you've got spasticity in your quads, that means uh, it's, that the quads is probably going to slow you down in bending your knee and you have to bend your knee very, very quickly, 600 degrees a second to get your leg forward for the next step, okay? And knee extensor spasticity is going to stop you doing that. Um, or greatly restricted anyway. But if you had um, spasticity in your calf, you're actually more likely to run, not less likely to run, okay? And it sort of makes sense because as long as you have medial lateral stability at your ankle, a bit of spasticity in your calf is just going to enhance that natural spring-like uh, mechanism that we want out of your calf muscle anyway. So you need to be very careful uh, when you think about uh, your patient or your athlete you know, they have a bit of spasticity, should you intervene or not? Okay, so uh, same thing applies uh, to people's arms. So, you know, when you walk, you, you want your arm down by your side swinging. And when you run, you want a short arm. Uh, uh, you know, a long arm is a slow arm when it comes to running. And you know, we uh, I know of a case for an Australian uh, 
uh, runner and she was world and Olympic champion and she had a terrible dystonic arm but did get injected uh, and was very effectively stopped her arm you know coming up but she couldn't run as fast because you know she had a long arm and that was no good for her running uh, so you know you need to make decisions around spasticity uh, very carefully if you're thinking about athletic performance because it's not you know one size fits all all the muscles that are important because they're not um, and some of the movements are speed dependent and spasticity the effect of spasticity is also speed dependent okay so one of the other uh things we rely on is the american college of sports medicine guidelines for resistance training so there are two main aspects uh, to these guidelines one is um, what people are most familiar with i suppose is the heavy resistance training um, so heavy resistance training or um, is that type of strength training where you're doing low low reps, low sets, and high load, okay? It's without doubt the most effective way of uh, making someone stronger, so it's not controversial. But another part of the guidelines is about uh, task-specific resistance training. And you do task-specific resistance training to improve function. You do heavy resistance strength training to improve strength, whereas you do task-specific training to improve function. And this is also very well established in healthy, able-bodied and elite populations, but just not so well uh, applied to neurological populations. So it goes through these criteria, which probably are common sense to everyone. You know, what does the muscle actually do? What range does it go through? Do we need to actually exercise the muscle through full range or just the range that's important for the task you're trying to affect? You know, what's the segmental alignment? And so it's not just the range that's acting on the knee, but what's actually happening at the ankle and the hip at the same time, stuff like that. And of course, the load and intensity and stuff is important too. But our elite colleagues are so uh, well developed in their task specific training uh, and that's one of the beautiful things about being a physio or strength conditioning coach you can just you know they specialize in sports you know and so if you look at a guy like this to give you a weird example you know you may not have seen you know strength training like this before but it's unsurprising when you see him trying to think his sport might be mogling okay and so when you go back, that makes sense, okay, when you think about what he's trying to achieve because this is probably not going to help, like slow, heavy resistance training given the speed demands um, of, of the task. And so then when we think about uh, elite sprinting, this is another old video because this is in the days when someone could actually beat Usain Bolt. Yeah, it's just impressive how still their head, arms, and trunk are, despite the range and speed which their um, limbs are moving. Okay, and so sprinting is a little bit different, you know, to distance running. And so, you know, we need to appreciate those distances, you know, uh, differences in arm swing and, and stuff like that. And uh, you know, this uh, Kenyan woman on the right saw, you know, win a silver medal at the London Olympics. Um, and looks a little bit malaligned and stuff. I remember thinking, geez, I hope she doesn't get injured because someone's going to probably try and fix her up. And she's, you know, she's already managed to be second best in the world the way she's going. Um, we need to be careful with um, making the easy observations, okay? Because uh, what's most crucial is the smooth translation of the center of mass, like moving your body forward and don't just pick on the easy thing to see um, without respect to how's that's going to change the rest of the way the person moves okay so speed has a big impact on uh on the way we move and so this is uh, walking data um but the same applies to running but no one's looked at it yet so this is the hip knee and ankle on the left and on the right is how quickly the joints are moving at the same um you know point in time and we can see you know down here at bottom right you know, nothing much changes at the ankle over a range of speeds in mid stance or swing but it push off you know there's a big change in how quickly the ankle has to move and so you know um and you take that uh, those differences say um at the knee and nearly double them for, for running because the knee moves so much more quickly so you know if you think the person's having trouble with decelerating the leg in terminal swing and it's you know at 600 degrees a second doing a, a, a prone hemi curl you know it's not going to help 
Um, so we need to be better with our exercise prescription. So the reason why you might do task-specific resistance training or fast resistance training is this. So if I take any one of you and get you to do heavy resistance, uh, sorry, just do a, a leg press, um, you know, just measure strength, this is how you generate force. Okay, so we, this is how long it takes and this is how much force is generated. Um, and so this is what, what happens. So if I then get you to do very heavy resistance training, uh, this is what occurs. You get much stronger, this dashed line, it's not controversial, you measure it with a one repetition max, you, you get much stronger, okay? But what we're trying to do with ballistic training is not just get stronger because, you know, running's, um, it, it's about how quickly you move, it's not a maximal strength activity, where it's not the strongest person that wins the race, it's the person who can turn their arms and legs on um, more quickly. What we're trying to do is not change how strong someone is, but how quickly they can generate force. Okay, so the strongest, uh, sorry, the most powerful event in any athletic sport is triple jumpers. Um, you know, eighteen times your body weight. So, you know, and if you've seen a triple jumper, the world record holder, Jonathan Edwards from England. You know, small, wiry guy, unbelievably powerful. You don't need to be heavily muscled. You don't have to have a lot of muscle bulk to do this. It's just a skill. And the skill is how quickly can you turn those muscles uh, on and off. So power is not about peak force, it's about the rate of force development, RFD, is the thing you often see. Okay, one of the challenges we have though in clinical practice or in sporting practice, um, not in the lab because there's tools in labs that you know, are not commonly available to us, is how we measure strength. Um, and historically, we've got some blunt tools that are pretty much meaningless, so if you grade a muscle, um, there's probably no point doing it. And we can measure strength with dynamometers, but what we think is that the more quickly you can move things, the more better, oh, sorry, the better you will perform, but we need a way of measuring that. So we need a way of measuring, you know, rate of force development. So peak force, you know, may take a little while. So this is one of our patient's traces, might take a little while to develop, but what we really want to see uh, is this. And so, so we want to try and change the maximum rate of uh, force development uh, and it's not just going to be a general test like at, at the knees and that's what most commonly gets tested particularly we want to know what's going on uh, at the ankle and so we might use a uh, an exercise like this so this is just a leg sled you can lose a, use a pilates reformer or anything similar I've colleagues who do this on a sliding tilt table okay so this is one of our eps just hopping you know and at this inclination it's probably about you know, 40 or 50% of body weight, so it's not a hot, heavy load. And then one of our young girls who's had a brain injury, now she thinks she's going okay because she's hopping on her affected leg. Um, and it's fast and it's sort of ticking some of the task-specific uh, boxes, but we know that people compensate with their proximal muscle groups. And so if she continues doing this exercise like this, she's going to just further strengthen her hip and, you know, hip and knee muscles and not her ankle. And so if we try and make it more specific, so this is the same thing again. Now she's about to swap to her left affected leg. She just can't do it when we tell her to try and not use her knee and just isolate the ankle. And so I, I think as therapists and coaches, once someone reaches a threshold of strength, we're pretty good because it's pretty easy. You know, we know how to load someone up, but we need to also know how to unload someone to get what we want. And in this case, we need to unload her. And probably the easiest way on this machine is just to drop it down lower, okay? And work out, you know, the, the, the range that she, um, the, her training range and the rules for progression. So put it down lower so we can actually get the ankle and not have the knee kicking in to help out. Um, and there's multiple ways you can do that, like on a leg sled or a Pilates reform. This is a guy with, you know, a lot of trouble with distal weakness. Okay, you don't see people run like this very much. But pretty severe accident. It's taken him a couple of years to get to this point. And I think about this in the context that his body is just too heavy for him. Okay, because we chuck him in an Alter G just because we happen to have one. Not everyone has an Alter G. And this is set at 85% of body weight, which means he's taking 85% of the load and the machine's only assisting him 15%, which is not a lot but dramatically different 
running performance. And so our challenge, whether you've got an L2G or not, is to work out how do we best challenge you know, our patients or athletes to get what we want, because that's what I want. Uh, I don't want any of this sort of stuff going on. Um, and there are other mechanisms for de-weighting people. Obviously, you can get in the pool. The pool is a good way to de-weight. The, the problem with the pool is if someone has a bit of a uh, control problem with their leg, it'll drift around. Um, or the resistance of the water might negate what you're trying to do with the, you know, versus the buoyancy, which is assisting. So, you know, try it and work out if you're actually achieving what it is, you know, you're trying to achieve. Um, this is the same guy in his early rehab. So, are we top left? So, this is a, um, hopefully, there's no one online that's uh, a rep from Lightgate. Uh, so this is someone using um, a light gate to assist him to walk because he, he's a two-person assist at this point. So he's in the light gate. And this concept we have that your trunk is your base of support, we're really keen on making sure people learn how to control their trunk right from the start. Okay, so he's very, very slow here, but you know he looks reasonably steady compared to uh, bottom left now where you know a couple of days later we've just said to him, let go. Okay, and the reason why we present without audio is because he is going off his nut. Um, <laughs> and it looks terrible and it is terrible and he's not happy, but he will never learn how to control his core if he's always holding on. Okay, so if I go top right and bottom right, same thing from the sagittal plane. Okay, so we have to work out how, what we're going to do about this. The, the problem with this is not just that he's so weak. The problem is the design of the machine because it's got two access points. Okay, So when he takes a step with his right foot, um, the left harness becomes the access point and it swings him laterally, completely stops up the progression of his center of mass. And then he steps his um, left foot and the right um, uh, attachment becomes the access point. So you know, what we probably need is something like this. This is from Liverpool, I think, actually. So it's got two attachments, but it's got one access point, okay? And so we need that access point to be right over the patient's head, right over their centre of mass. And so it's going to hopefully uh, give them the opportunity to good, do good practice rather than actually um, disturb uh, how their centre of mass moves. So they're just a few ideas in terms of uh, exercises at like the impairment level if we're trying to you know, um, make muscles move more quickly, so more powerfully, you know, regardless of whether they got uh, spasticity or not, we would do that. But then you can't just exercise and expect it to translate into running. You need to, um, you know, do running training. And, you know, often you'll see people doing running drills, uh, but sometimes, you know, without an understanding of what they're trying to achieve. So like the, the fast feet drill that you know, a lot of people do, you know, it's all about training the cadence, getting your brain used to moving your legs faster and faster without forward speed. So we're dissociating forward speed from leg speed. It's also about being up on your toes and really challenging the ankle and the calf. You just remember it's you know, cadence and step length. But the muscle group that changes the most when you go from walking to running and then running faster and faster is your hip flexors. Okay? So then you know, that's why you introduce you know, that single leg uh, drill. And then you know, we then work on alternating so that we know people can dissociate their legs from each other. Uh, but we also know that in terms of running faster, those initial changes are about stride length. And so that's, you know, at a, at a more high level. Uh, you know, you might do some bounding type drills. So uh, people do these drills, but we probably need to be a little bit specific as to why we do them and, and how we do them. Um, and a key thing about banding is how quickly do you get on and off the ground? Because you've got to remember it's about leg stiffness is what we're trying to you try and get on and off the ground more quickly without bending too much and then having to recover. Um, okay. Uh, the core exercise for anyone who's done that. This is one of my guys with a terrible demonstration of how you do the claw. So it's another old dark video. But I mean... You know, this guy couldn't run for three years and now he's doing 5K front runs regularly. Uh, and we just need to make sure here that he's using his iliopsoas for hip flexion and not recruiting his rec fem because it's such a common thing we see in our patients. Now we'd also um, use theraband or theratubing or a cable 
um, for an exercise like this because it has two benefits. One is the fast uh, hip extension power generation when your leg's in front of you, but then uh, the overpressure in the end of swing phase to help the leg come out more quickly. Okay, so they're just a few uh, training ideas. So just to finish with, you know, in terms of advancing your clinical practice, treatment or coaching to improve running, uh, I think it's very important to have a very good understanding of biomechanics, uh, what the joints are doing and what the muscles are doing, uh, acting on those joints so we can be as specific as possible with our interventions. Uh, despite all the impairments associated with movement, so uh, balance, uh, spasticity, weakness, motor control, it's the strength is the key impairment that we need to spend more time on. We don't disregard the others, but it's, uh, the, the strength is a key thing. But it's not, we don't, we're not after a uniform improvement in someone's strength uh, or a general improvement in strength. We want to be very specific in the muscles we target and how we target them. For some, we want to target you know, concentrically. Others, we want to just target the eccentric aspect of their performance. So be very specific with your exercise prescription, but also your selection of the running drills you do. Um, and then other things to consider, sort of, I haven't got time to talk about, but uh, AFOs and stuff like that, because there are some AFOs you can use as a training tool you know, to give someone the feeling of what it's like to get on and off the ground more quickly and help them get the feeling of and understanding of energy storage and release, because that's what some of these carbon fiber AFOs are designed to do. Uh, and be very careful with your spasticity interventions because, um, you know, there's some people that like to inject and, um, you know, the joke is that um, if the only tool in your toolbox is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And just because there's spasticity there doesn't mean it needs to be, you know, uh, addressed. You've got to work out, is it impeding the function that I'm trying to uh, improve? Thank you. Thank you very much, Gavin. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, we've got time for a couple of questions. Is there anybody online or in the audience? A microphone as well. That's great. Um, resistance training, it's really weird pulling yourself back with this, isn't it? Um, with the resistance training, you also mentioned the gains that can come with uh, kind of standard resistance training, kind of big weights, kind of big strength gains. Then you had the gains that come with uh, your ballistic resistance training, so not as big strength gains, but more specificity. Yeah. Is there an argument for having kind of the best of both worlds? You want to have some kind of big weights for those strength gains and also some kind of ballistic training for the more specific or would you yeah it's a good question so probably so well the literature says you, you should not do ballistic training until you've done strength training first okay um, because you will get either very very sore or injured okay so you need to have a base of strength first okay which i think most people have by the time they get to this point um but then uh, and probably it gets to your question gets towards periodization. So, you know, you'd have the off season where you might start to go um, into some heavier training and then, you know, transition into some ballistic training. So yeah, I, I probably wouldn't think about it um, in terms of doing a bit of both together. It probably comes to, uh, you know, do some strength training first and then as you become more competent, get into more ballistic training, but then also the periodization uh, throughout the season. Yeah. You definitely need to have a base of strength first, it's probably a little bit relevant, less relevant to the people you've seen because most of the stuff that elite athletes would be doing would be full body weight, okay? Whereas what you've seen here is normally sub body weight. They're laying down on a um, leg sled or Pilates reformer. So it's only a proportion of body weight. So we don't really have a issue with, um, you know, delayed onset muscle soreness and uh, stuff like that. Any other questions? We have a question online. 
uh, Gavin. So this is a question from Michelle. I have a client who gets some clonus with running. Can you suggest some ideas for how to work around this? She's great at walking now and has significantly improved strength since the original incident. She was right hemicide uh, hemiplegia initially. Um, oh, it's probably one of those things you need to see. Uh, so if they get clonus in running, I assume that means that you can see the leg shaking. Um, after push off, like you know, through swing phase, uh, and depends if it matters or not. The things we would do is sometimes we use a light spring lift AFO, sometimes we use an ASO. My first priority is do they have a stable foot on the ground? We can't have people rolling their ankles and getting injured. So, do they have a stable foot on the ground? So, do we need to tape it or do we need an ASO or some sort of sports ankle brace to give them a stable foot on the ground? Um, and then the key thing after push off is you know a quick and smooth transition into hip knee flexion uh, but that is also assisted if you get some people call it like an ankle snap just to get the toes up as quickly as possible in that transition back into swing phase so um i, I 10 years ago i would probably say oh you get injected but now I'd, yeah, maybe not okay one of those guys i showed um as a young kid as a footballer, he got back to playing footy, which is, you know, pretty incredible given he had a complete hemi, had nothing in his arm or leg for a while. Uh, at two years, he was back uh, winning the club time trials um, and then played the following season. And he would have a bit of a hyperextending knee sometimes when he walked and didn't concentrate, but it didn't, in fact, it didn't impact him running at all. Um, and his physio, he was a few hours out of Melbourne, um, organised for him to have a Botox injection because she was fussed about his knee hop extension. Um, so an injection in his calf, and it, it basically he could control his knee if he slowed down and thought about it, but he didn't care. It didn't fuss him. Um, so he got injected, and then he was coming third or fourth in his time trials, and he was crushed. Um, so the spasticity just did not matter for his fun. Like he could run, he could kick a foot, he could do all those sort of things, but the person was prior, you know more fussed about his walking, which was not his goal. So, uh, yeah, it's, you know, this intervention has to be very specific and takes a bit of time to think through. Thanks, Gavin. Um, we've got another question from Jessica. Uh, she would like to know if there's any difference between running training for people recovering from a neurological insult compared to those with a chronic neurological condition such as cerebral palsy? Uh, no, just the biomechanics of running is the biomechanics of running. Um, you know, you've got to be careful with adults with CP because, I mean, we have to look after the musculoskeletal system. Our colleagues in Norway did a study looking at running with adult CP. They had an eight-week intervention and they wanted to do it for longer but they didn't have the funding. And they did this mixed methods uh, Study. So they, you know, they did the intervention, they looked at their outcome measures that they're working on, but then they did these interviews with the patients and the patients said, now these are, you know, community dwelling, you know, people, ambulant people with um, cerebral palsy, some of who could run. They reported it took between four and six weeks to get the hang of the exercises. Okay. Which means the intervention was probably only two to four weeks long you know, at best. So it, it's going to take um, people. Uh, a while, you know, particularly, so whether it's a chronic stroke versus chronic, it's not chronic CP, but adult CP versus chronic stroke, um, you know, the person with uh, stroke has no, no normal, whereas the person with CP yeah, hasn't and, you know, or may not have uh, particularly well. And so, like, it, it, it's a bit more difficult, you know, and might take a bit longer because it's weird you know, to do something like this if you've never done it before. So, you know, you have to have the confidence um, to persist and as a therapist not get bored. I've done this for a while. It's getting bored. The patient's getting bored. Let's do something else. No, stick to your guns. This is the biomechanics. doesn't matter what your diagnosis is or your chronic, chronicity is. This is the biomechanics. This is what the muscles do. These are the best exercise or intervention to try and address that and just stick to it. And persist. Brilliant. I love that. Um, we've probably got time for just one more question, but I can see there's heaps online. 
Uh, we might be doing a follow-up lecture for all the physios online um, through the Australian Physiotherapy Association, and we'll see if we can link that with CPSAR as well. Um, but our last question is from Jess, and she's asked, what would you say to a neurological patient who wants to start running, running training or practice in order to improve their walking speed? Are these things better trained separately? Uh, no, the running is a progression of walking. So, you know, walking has a ceiling effect. Like you can only walk so fast before it's natural to get into a run. Um, for the vast majority of people, uh, by doing this high-level training, their walking just naturally improves because the three most important muscle groups for forward propulsion for walking are the same muscle groups, you know, for running. Um, uh, but there are, we do have a subgroup of people who uh, run better than they walk. Okay? And it's probably got to do with the double support phase and, um, you know, trouble with their step length, which is, you know, messing up their pelvis. So there are a few differences, but, you know, it's, it's just for those people, for me, it's just about improving their mobility. And for most of them, the vast majority will walk a lot better as a result of, you know, doing that sort of training. And the training is a continuum. You start at, you know, might be 10% of body weight for someone who's having trouble walking and then it's full body weight for someone um, who's progressing into running. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, um, Gavin. And uh, thank you to everybody who attended online and in person today. It was great to have um, you all here to listen. Uh, if there's any feedback, um, please send us an email afterwards and we will be sending out a recording in the following weeks to everybody who's registered um, online for today's event. Thank you.